Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I would like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. God is with us no matter what. Good to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. He didn't build it with his hands, but it is his place that we've dedicated to him. Amen. Good to have all of you joining us by live stream as well. We're delighted to be coming into your life, hopefully into your living room and not out in your front yard where you would be freezing if you're here close to us. Cold day today, huh? Cold walk. I walked yesterday and went out to the mountains up on the ridge and uh, it was 5 to 10 degrees colder. The wind was blowing and I thought, I am insane. What is going on here? We are ready for warm weather, right? Holidays are past. Let's get it in high gear. Well, we got to make it through January. Next Saturday, this coming Saturday and Sunday, Saturday night, 6 o'clock, Dr. Paul I will be here with us and again on Sunday morning in both services. He is our friend, originally from Vietnam, led the Assemblies of God there for many years and uh, just an amazing story, but also a person who's very close to the Lord. We're excited to have him coming here and I pray and trust that you'll be able to be with us Saturday night and or Sunday morning. God's going to use him, I believe, in great ways. This coming Wednesday night, we are here in the building again. We have opportunities for kids. Royal Rangers, couldn't find the word. And uh, girls ministries and nursery and starting this Wednesday night, youth as well. So youth, you'll be here in the building with us at 630 for worship and then you will be headed over to the upper room and uh, we'll let you know what's happening there as we get to it. All right. I think we're going to have a great day today. God is with us. He's going to do great things in our midst. Amen. We uh, just finished out something fantastic, and that is we completed one year of Sam's Club, of reaching kids through prayer, just praying for them and supporting them. And we are launching now into our second year of Sam's Club. Miss Sonia is coming this morning to tell you a little bit more about it. God bless you. Miss Sonia, welcome this morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who participated last year in Sam's Club. You may be saying, what's Sam's Club? I have a membership to Costco. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about praying for children in the same way that Hannah prayed for Samuel. And so we've called it Sam's Club. We're, we're praying for kids that they would love and serve God and be a part of his will and purpose being accomplished on the earth as it is in heaven. And so we finished that last year and we found out it was the greatest gift we had for me. I can say that it was one of the greatest gifts I had in 2020 praying for that child. I received just as much as I gave last year in praying for that child. So I want to invite you if you did not participate with us last year, I don't want to leave you out. You will be blessed. I promise you, I guarantee you, you will be blessed praying for a child. Now, my lists are coming together, and I have about seven to ten kids left. Now, here's my pressure. We just got finished reading in Genesis the way that Abraham prayed for Lot to be saved, and God heard him and saved Lot. Some of our kids live in that same kind of atmosphere that Lot was in. They need someone praying for them to rescue them out. And that's my challenge to you, because sometimes you just need a goal. 
Some of you are very goal-oriented, and you just need a goal. What's the point? What's the purpose? What do you want me praying? I want you to rescue the lots around us because I believe God will hear your prayer and rescue them the same way he did because I know that he's faithful. He's faithful to his word. What he did then, he's going to do today because that is who he is. So if that's you, you want to join us, then call the church. You can call me. You can email me. You can contact me this week. Please do it quickly because I want to finalize these this week. I wanted to do it last week. Um, And then I will let you know the parameters and the guidelines that we work in um, as we do this ministry because there are there are guidelines that we follow as we pray for kids, okay? Because we're going to keep everybody safe. Children need protected. And prayer is powerful, and that's the most important thing. So let's pray this morning as we start. I say this in chapel a lot and in kids' church a lot. What have you brought today? What have you brought in this place today to offer up as your worship? Because if you're like me, I don't sing very well. So I'm not necessarily going to say, God, you got my voice today. You have my melody because my melody isn't worth squat. I don't want to give him that. I want to give him my heart. So what have you brought today? Think about that for a second. Have you brought him your love? Have you brought him your joy? Have you brought him your devotion? Have you brought him your will? Are you choosing him today? Are you choosing him right now to be a part of his will and what he's doing? Have you given your life to him? Are you giving him your obedience today? Join with me in prayer today as you think about what you're bringing today in this moment as we gather together to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. What are you going to offer him? God, we lift up your name in this place today because you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are faithful. You are true. You are just. You are merciful. God, we love you. God, the only thing we can offer you to this day is ourselves. We come before you humbly today, recognizing our need for a rescuer. We need you, God. We need you like never before. And I call out to you with the assurance that you have heard us in this place as we bind our faith together. So now, Lord, I receive the help of the Holy Spirit to give you back the worship you deserve. God, we cannot love you unless you first loved us, unless you empower us to love you back properly. So right now in this place, I receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the help, the love, and the kindness to give it back to you in the way that you deserve. Be among us in this place today. Be among us throughout the airwaves in this community where everybody is who would watch this later. May your anointing be felt. May it be experienced. May the love of Jesus be real because it's here right now and we receive it in order to worship you back. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. So good again to see you today and to be here to worship. Good to have the band back with us. We are going to try now in this new year, still with caution and with an understanding that there is a virus around and amongst us, we're going to try and little by little ease back into some normalcy. It'll take time, but we will eventually get there with the Lord's help. Amen. I didn't realize I had left these samples up here. I was looking up at the screen earlier and said, oh, wow, that looks unattractive. But I had them up here Wednesday night because we are trying this month and next to redo the, the coverings of the platform here. We're going to do some stone and carpet and a, and a decking material up here so that we can move forward with this place being attractive as well as spiritually warm. Amen. All right, well, Pastor Pete has alerted me this morning that Facebook is monitoring everything and everybody all at one time, that the New World Order has begun, the Antichrist is in power, and that we are not allowed to talk about politics today. Hallelujah, I won't. Go in your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings in the Old Testament. (laughs) Just the term kings, right? (laughs) Go to the book of 1 Kings. Um, I'm also... 
corrected that youth will be in the prayer room Wednesday night. The upper room has been taken over by kindergarten, I believe. And so youth will meet after we worship in here Wednesday night. Youth will be behind us here in the prayer room. 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 through 9. For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. Then during the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah went to visit King Ahab of Israel. Let's remind ourselves of who these folks are and where these kingdoms are. Israel, the former Israel, is now two different kingdoms or lands. You have the northern, which is called Israel. It has retained that name. That's the northern tribes, about ten. And then you have the southern, which is now named Judah. And that is the tribe of Judah and Benjamin there together, and they form the southern kingdom known as Judah. The book of Kings follows these two uh, until 2 Kings when Israel falls. They, the northern kingdom is kind of um, extinguished first, and then the southern kingdom. And the word extinguished might be too strong. During the visit, king, the king of Israel said to his officials, Do you realize that the town of Ramoth-Gilead belongs to us, and yet we've done nothing to recapture it from the king of Aram? Then he turned to Jehoshaphat and asked, Will you join me in battle to recover Ramoth-Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, Well, of course, you and I are as one. (laughs) No, they really weren't, but sometimes for political expediency you'll say, Well, there went the word, didn't it? You will say things you should not say and agree to things you ought not agree. My troops are your troops, and my horses are your horses. Then Jehoshaphat added, but first, let's find out what the Lord says. (laughs) Have you ever been reading God's Word and read a phrase and just thought, oh, I know this is not going to end well? Uh, Let's find out what the Lord says. Now that we have a plan, let's see if God will bless it. So the king of Israel summoned the prophets, about 400 of them, and asked them, should I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back? They all all replied, yes, go right ahead. The Lord will give the king victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. Now, I think I read where the 400 were prophets of the Lord. I'm pretty sure that's what I just read. I don't know what the dress code was, the appearance the language. I don't know if you had a membership badge on. I don't know if Jehoshaphat just means, listen, you got your northern prophets and we got our southern prophets because this is always what happens when there's great division. And uh, I, I was wondering if maybe we could find one other person to talk to the Lord for us. Verse 8, the king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, there is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. <laughs> How would you like to be that man? <laughs> huh? Oh, here I am, Lord. Use me. Oh, God, I pray you'll use me. Use me like never before. And then God says, okay, here's how I want to use you. No, don't use me, Lord. Use somebody else. Be careful what you ask for, right? Although we don't know that Micaiah had ever asked for this. Jehoshaphat replied, that's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. Verse 9, so the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imla. A few months ago, I talked to you about the ministry, the office, the calling of the evangelist. Today, I want to talk to you about the prophet. I want to call the, the calling of the prophet. If I had to title this message, I could title a lot of other things, but I had a sense that there would be people online watching everybody and everything. So I have <laughs> had to really struggle to limit my title to only something very uh, non-threatening, non-challenging, non-confrontational, calling the prophet. If there was ever a time, a couple of months ago I told you we need evangelists, but we also need a prophet or two, right? It's just that kind of a, of a situation. Now notice, if you will, in Uh, verse 6. So the king of Israel, in the New Living, the king of Israel summoned the prophets. The King James says he gathered them. But then when we read about Micaiah, he called for him. And I know that's a small thing. It may look insignificant. You, as you read with me, 
probably didn't even notice it, and I didn't notice it at first. But I want to bring to you today, I want to bring it to your attention, that is not a small thing. And I, again, I want you to understand, there, uh, one of the Bibles I have in the King James inserts a word there that says false. He, co- he summoned the fall and, and gathered in the King James. And then they insert that word in brackets and they say false prophets. It, it doesn't say that. These are not the prophets of Baal that we read about when Elijah went up on the mountain. All of them are killed. Nobody's interested in being a prophet of Baal right now. Even though this is... This is a different situation. We're not going to hearken back to that. But these prophets, nevertheless, are political prophets. Would you not agree? Boy, that word just keeps jumping up there today, doesn't it? Dear Facebook, I apologize. So sorry. So these are political prophets. Let me tell you something today. Anytime the church becomes political, the church has lost the prophetic. You cannot be both. It is not possible. As a matter of fact, it is not desirable. Whenever the church becomes political, the church is not able to be prophetic. And as Leonard Ravenhill said years ago, we have a sick church and a dying world. And if ever there was a time when the world needs the church to be prophetic, it's now. Amen? The world needs the church to be prophetic. But there's a price to being prophetic, a deep price. It it requires a dependence on God, a dependence on God's word, and really kind of not even caring about. And that I know when I say that, some of you may not understand what I mean. Am, Am I a citizen of the country I live in? Yes, I am. Do I have opinions and thoughts? Yes, I do. But whenever you are political, you are flowing with your feelings. The Bible calls us to flow with the Spirit. These 400, get it, 400 all said the same thing. You can't get four people to agree on anything. But all of a sudden, these 400 all agreed. Yep, go, king. Let's go. Come on, come on. This is our finest hour. Let's go beat the snot out of them. Can I say that? Is that okay to say that? And uh, you're going to (laughs) win. I love it. The prophets aren't expecting to go into battle themselves, but they're more than willing to... Say to the king, go, go ahead, you know, it'll be fine. Uh, you may know the rest of the story, it's not fine. When you're flowing with your feelings, all of us have feelings, all of us, every human being. And when you come into the presence of God, part of what begins to happen is that you have to step out of, away from, beyond your feelings. And that's not possible except the Lord Jesus Christ do it for us. He helps us to step out of or to crucify our old nature, our feelings, emotions, whatever. Now, is it wrong to be emotional? No, absolutely not. But what I'm talking about is when it comes to following God, he sometimes will ask us to do things that don't look to our mind, they don't feel to our feelings like the right thing. But God is still saying, trust me, trust me. So we have to know how to get beyond our feelings. And you and I as humans, we can't do it without his help, without the Holy Spirit causing us to say, I I know how I feel, but I've been touched by him. I know how I feel, but I've had experiences with him. I've had him deliver me. I've had him sanctify me. I've had him change my mind about things, and he's never failed me. I'm not going to give up now. Who was it, the martyr of the early church? Arrhenius Ignatius that said when they were getting ready to burn him at the stake or feed him to the lions, I forget which, which one, 80 and two years I've served him and he's never done me wrong. I won't turn my back on him now. It was 82 or 80 and six, but he was an old guy. And those were his last words. All right. Uh, Micaiah had been called. He, he was called. And I know it's the New Living take on it, but I, I, I do like it in verse 9. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, bring Micaiah. Son of Imla. Okay, so how do we know who's prophetic and what is the ministry of the prophet? I, I have been used a number of times. I'm not a prophet, but I have been used. Some of you in this building have as well. As a matter of fact, probably many of you. 
I have failed on at least one occasion to give a word to a congregation years ago that I knew I was supposed to give. And I also knew some of the fallout and the consequences, and I did not, and that still haunts me to this day. I have failed on an occasion or two to give a word to a person, and that still haunts me to this day. I don't like... Uh, I don't like being asked by the Lord, being nudged, being compelled to give a word. I hate it even worse when I know I'm supposed to and I don't. So this, this is why many believers, many Christians say, I don't want anything to do with the work, the ministry, or the assignment of the prophet. But I'm sorry, it's kind of part and parcel with walking with God. I don't mean that he's going to speak through us prophetically all the time, every day. But what I mean is the office of the prophet and the office of the believer have similarities. It's your feelings that get, get you in trouble. And so we're being called away from those. There are times when your feelings overflow. There are times when your feelings are on the surface and they're healthy. And I'm, I'm not saying ignore your feelings. I'm not saying don't deal with them. But what I'm saying is when they conflict with you, what you know God is clearly asking you to do. Those feelings have to fall by the wayside. They have to be submitted or surrendered. They have to be subjected. They have to be brought under the lordship of him. Okay, so we're just going to go through a big part of this uh, section here, this whole chapter, not the whole chapter, but I just want to read it to you because you and I will see what we need to see. Verse 10. King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah, dressed in their royal robes, were sitting on thrones at the threshing floor near the gate of Samaria. All of Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, made some iron horns and proclaimed, This is what the Lord says. With these horns you will gore the Arameans to death. All the other, <laughs> oh, help me, Lord. All the other prophets agreed. You could ask them what flavor of ice cream they wanted, and no two of them would have agreed. You could have asked them whether it was sunshine out or rain, and they wouldn't have agreed. But when one of them says, oh, you, you got the victory, all of them said, yep, you got the victory. Do we have any evidence? No, no, the Lord said it. Do we have any evidence of the Lord speaking through this guy? Oh, it doesn't matter. These are the Lord's prophets. How many of you are... Um, uh, don't show me your hands. But if you've joined us in any form or fashion on this Daniel fast, you are um, experiencing, I hope, some of what I'm experiencing. This is, this is crazy. I don't understand how I can be full and miserable at the same time. I don't understand how I can be full and not satisfied. I don't understand how I can eat great food and still be angry that I'm not getting to eat great food. God wants to teach us things. And sometimes when he's teaching us, he takes us through land, territory, things we've never been through before. And, and he calls us out from the familiar. All the other prophets agree, they said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, for the Lord will give the king victory. Meanwhile, the messengers who went to get Micaiah said to him, look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and promise success. <laughs> But Micaiah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what the Lord tells me to say. Well, then I got news for you, Micaiah. You are in trouble because 400 other guys and the king and all his officials agree that this is what God wants. And they have to be right because obviously there's strength in numbers. Oh, well, okay, maybe we should read on, huh? Verse 15, when Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should we hold back? Micaiah replied, sarcastically, yes, go up and be victorious, for the Lord will give the king victory. But the king replied sharply, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? Then Micaiah told him in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. Now you listen to who he's talking about. I saw Israel, the people of the covenant. I saw God's people scattered on the mountain. We've heard a lot of prophets 
over the last few years and particularly so over the last few months. I've heard many of them all say the same thing, slap each other on the back, compliment one another and say, we're all saying the right thing. This is what the Lord says. Then Micaiah said in a vision, I saw Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Didn't I tell you the king of Israel? Well, let's stop right there. Number one this morning, declaring takes discipline. If you're going to declare in your own life, part of what the prophet has to do is speak to themselves. This is why I tell you that when, when we read of the gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, I, I don't think that we should be thinking of those as somebody else. They all manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to an extent, the quality and character of those are to be within, they're to reside in all of us. They just are. And so the prophet has to be a person of discipline. You tell me about the intensity of what Micaiah faced. You tell me about the pressure, the political pressure. That word just keeps popping up there. You tell me about the intensity and, and the, 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 the attempt to pull him over. He knew what he was going into before the messengers ever said, now listen, we know how you've acted before, but you do that this time and it's over for you. They've all said that we're going in, we're going to have victory, so you need to say the same thing. But discipline for us as believers reminds us that not only are we part of a heavenly kingdom that will eventually rule here on earth, but we are part of that kingdom now. That this earth doesn't hold for us what that place does. That the, not just the wealth, well, the church doesn't have wealth, so we're not attached to the world. But the church has access to fame. The church has access to power, always. I'm not talking about in a particular time, but always. Because when the church is prophetic, the power wants the prophetic. Remember when Peter and the others prayed and, and people received the Holy Spirit and Simon the sorcerer, was it Simon the sorcerer heard them and, and said, what, what can I give to have this power? When the church is walking in the prophetic, the world recognizes it. But you can't come into the prophetic except through Jesus Christ. But then the world will try and find other ways because the world doesn't want to surrender the lordship of Jesus Christ. So the world will say, what if we do this? What if, well, that didn't work. Let's try this. Let's try that. And we have to be careful because our success in the prophetic opens doors for us that only discipline will keep us from walking through. Now, I'm not talking about America. All right, because I don't want to get kicked off Facebook. Oh, Lord knows I don't want kicked off of Facebook. Please, please. <laughs> Micaiah said, I'll only say what the Lord tells me. We may not be prophets, but we should be disciplined in our talking. Because 1 Thessalonians, this is the Old Testament. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, and working with your hands. Well, Pastor the Apostle was just talking to that particular culture and that particular time, and he, <laughs> okay, great. But nevertheless, for those who want to be prophetic, if you want to be seen by God as a believer that has the same kind of spiritual integrity and vitality as a prophet, you'll understand what the New Testament is saying when it tells you and I to make it our goal to live a quiet life minding our own business and working with our hands. That would have been a great place for an amen. But Okay, let's read on. Verse 18. Didn't I tell you the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, he never prophesies anything but trouble for me. <laughs> well, maybe the problem isn't the prophet. Surely not. He never prophesies anything but trouble. Then Micaiah continued, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him on his right and his left. And the Lord said, who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? There were many suggestions. And finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. 
How will you do this, the Lord asked. And the Spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. Now, theologically, I don't have an explanation for you here. All I can do is just keep reading, okay? I can't comment. I've not been there to see how this works. That, to me, looks like a lying, seducing, deceiving spirit that's in the presence of God among all the hosts of heaven. All the armies gathered around the Lord, and it looks like the Lord basically said, okay. But it also looks to me like somebody was about to get what they wanted. And it's always a bad deal whenever all the prophets say, this is what the Lord says. And well, Keep your mouth shut, Doug. Keep your mouth shut. Verse 23. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all your prophets. Now this is one prophet talking to the king in front of everybody. This is a guy they go ahead to go and get who has oftentimes been persecuted by this king. He has been mocked in the media, made fun of on Twitter. He has been rejected, maligned, marginalized, and now they get him back here because he's the prophet. And it's the discipline in his life. He's not perfect, he's not flawless, but he's disciplined. And so we pick it up in verse 23. For the Lord has pronounced your doom. Ooh, that's tough, right? 24, then Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, walked up to Micaiah. You know he's not going to be happy, right? And slapped him across the face. Since when did the Spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you, he demanded. See, that's why I kind of, I struggle with people who want to call these folks false prophets. Now, I, but you can use that term as long as you understand they're not prophets of Baal. They are in the visible church. And they think there are many years of fame and fortune or their many opportunities to access power or whatever allows them to flow in their feelings and call it the word of the Lord. Let me ask you again. I've asked you this question twice. Are you sure that any, either of the two political candidates that ran for office in November in the United States, are you sure either one of them is going to be the next president? Verse 24. Then Zedekiah walked up to Micaiah, slapped him in the face, said, When did the Spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you? He demanded. And Micaiah replied, You will find out soon enough when you are trying to hide in some secret room. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. Take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to my son Joash. Give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. But Micaiah replied, If you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, Everyone mark my words. Number two, Many prophets are slap happy. Many prophets are slap happy. <laughs> How you and I live as believers still matters. And see, when we get, when the church has access, when the church has power from the world, power from politics, power from Hollywood, or power from anything but Jesus Christ, the church has a tendency to not care so much about how we live. We flow with our feelings. We don't discipline our desires. But the Bible that you have, the Bible that you've pledged to surrender to, and the Lord who gave us this word, who lived and died for the word, the Lord who is the word says, oh, time out. No, 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 no. Whoa, how you live, how you act with one another is still critically important. Uh, let me quote to you from the New Testament. James chapter 1, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Hmm, human anger. The King James says it this way, for the wrath of man produceth not the righteousness of God. For the wrath of man, maybe it produces isn't the word there, it's in the King James. I haven't mem had it memorized. Does not bring forth the righteousness of God. So our I, our actions matter. You know, I've been amazed the last few years at how many people that have said to me or other pastors across this nation, people, 
outside the church, maybe a, a smattering in the church, but I just don't get involved in church politics. And those very people are now neck deep in the world's politics. I, I, never, I always struggle to understand that. Like, ah, oh, I'm not political. I don't get involved in politics. And we have to be careful because all of us, me, I don't know about you, but I know me. I know how quickly I can be pulled away, how easily I can be influenced and swayed. And if I don't anchor myself in the Lord Jesus Christ, if I don't come back to that on a regular basis, sometimes throughout my day, I know how easy it is for my emotions and my anger to... And nothing godly comes from it. Nothing good. Right? It just creates more chaos and more problems among people around me. And I have to watch for that. Number one, declaring takes discipline. Number two, many prophets in the church today, just like back then, are slap happy. Oh, went right up to him, slapped him right in the face. When did the Spirit of God leave me? Oh, so... <laughs> Well, well, obviously, now we know the Spirit of God left sometime at least within the last five minutes. Because you hearing something you don't like doesn't mean that you get to assault that person in the kingdom of God. Outside, I don't know. I, am, I don't referee what goes on out there. My job is to understand what goes on in the church because I'm the pastor, a pastor, and what goes on in my heart because I'm a believer, a disciple. Remember that word? A disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against that. You think government, you think division in the nation, you think anything can come against Jesus Christ and prevail? It cannot. And as long as you're anchored in him, as long as you're walking with him, as long as you're loving him, you are covered. You are protected. He will cover your mind and keep you fixed on him. He will cover your emotions and keep you surrendered to him. He will cover your soul and keep Keep you in mental health with him. Nothing will move you. The gates of hell will not prevail against you because you belong to the king of glory. His blood flows in your veins. You love him. His breath is in your lungs. You live for him. And if necessary, you'll die for him and nobody else. Come on. Jesus Christ died for the church, lives for the church, loves the church, gave himself for the church. We're not following anything but him. We're not in love with anything but him. We don't need anything but him. That's one of the things I found most fascinating about this fast. I knew this was the point going into it, but I've never done it before. I had a lot of people say, you've never done a Daniel fast? No. And Sister Pam's the same way. We've just always felt like, I don't even want to mess around with some food, you know, and the figuring out the menu. And Oh, boy, figuring out the menu. Like, we've eaten rice every day. And... Uh, and then just the, the whole idea of like uh, eating food and call, saying you're fasting. Ah, but I'll tell you what. This thing makes you recognize how many things you desire. We've got a candy dish in the middle of the table. I don't know why we didn't banish it, bury it in the backyard, set it on fire or something. I don't know. I'm not even a big candy eater. I can, it, it sits there all the time. We walk right by it. I'm telling you something, though. The devil got in that candy dish, and those chocolate pieces are talking to me, and the caramels are just singing. They got a little chorus going, a little worship song. And they just, whoa, woo, come into the river of caramel and chocolate. Come, drink of your fill. It's like the Song of Solomon for candy lovers, you know. We, we have all these things and the reason that we fast and pray, the reason we read our Bible and share our faith is because those things help us to recognize our own desires and to see how they conflict with the desires of the king, with his will, his life, and how he lives. See, we're already members. We're already in, 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 uh, citizens of the kingdom of him. We're not citizens here. Yeah, I have a passport. And yes, I understand how important this and that and the other is. But what I'm telling you is, is that he's called us to be in the world now as far as where we breathe our air, but to be of his world. But you and I can't do that in our own strength and power. It is not possible. So last year we began to move you towards 
reading together. I, I am not saying that, that this church wasn't a Bible reading church, but I want us to begin to speak the same language. And this year we're into the Old Testament together, reading Old and New. And if you don't have that yet, if you're not uh, following with us, you can get that. Uh, Pastor Pete posted some stuff. And if you're not online but you want us to print out the reading things, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes so that we're all together speaking and hearing the same language. And that's the word of the living God. Amen? All right, we're running out of time this morning. Let's go to this third thing. If you uh, didn't like the others, you'll like me now. Verse 29. So King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. Now, one of the reasons that Micaiah says, it almost seems like anticlimactic when he says, if you come back alive, it means the Lord didn't speak to me. But remember, he's saying that in front of all of the 400 prophets. All of the government officials and the two kings. And what he is saying between those lines is that whenever you see that they didn't have the word of the Lord, it's imperative that you begin to only follow when it's the word of the Lord. He uses a negative, I believe. You may see it differently. The negative, well, if if you come back alive, then I was wrong. He's not saying, oh, well, maybe I heard from the Lord, maybe I didn't. What he's saying so as to not get himself killed if possible. I mean, God didn't ask him to die for the word if necessary. But in this situation, he's just saying, listen, if you come back alive, it means I didn't hear the Spirit of God. You die in the battlefield, I want to remind everybody that you died because the word of the Lord said, don't do this. Now, God wasn't, I, you can read into it whatever you choose to read into it, but I think it's God's grace that through Jehoshaphat saying, God, somehow, speaking through him, isn't there one more guy who can give us the word of the Lord? And so that word came through Micaiah, and the word was, no, you're not going to win. So turn around. Don't do this. Well, Pastor, it was the Lord's will, and it seems like there was a fork in the road. It seems like there was an option. It seems like there was a possibility for a choice here. And what, what uh, the king said was, hey, I'm, I'm going with all of them. You can forget. We'll show you. And so let's keep that in mind. Then king, of a- king Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, as we go into battle, I'll disguise myself so no one will recognize me. But you wear your royal robes. <laughs> okay, thanks, friend. <laughs> thanks, buddy. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had issued these orders to his 32 chariot commanders. Attack only the king of Israel. Whoever has on the royal robes, kill him. Don't bother with anyone else. So when the Aramean chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes, they went after him. There's the king of Israel, they shouted. But when Jehoshaphat called out, the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel, and they stopped chasing him. An Aramean soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops and hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. How unbelievable is that? You couldn't tell him from 10,000 other guys in the battle. He had made sure that he was not distinguishable in any way, but the enemy flung an arrow haphazardly, and not only did it find the one that should have been unable to find, it was able to lodge right between the joint, breastplate and shoulder of his armor. Mm. hit the king of Israel turn the horses and get me out of here Ahab groaned to the driver of his chariot I'm badly wounded the battle raged all that day and the king remained propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans the blood from his wound ran down to the floor of his chariot and as evening arrived he died just as the sun was setting the cry ran through his troops we're done for run for your lives What is a prophet? 
What is the ministry of the prophet? Number one, declaring takes discipline. You and I are called to be disciples. We are called to live a disciplined life. Now that that can look a little bit different for us as we mature in the Lord. It can look different for us based on culture and and things within the church I'm talking about. How, How we go through these phases and stages takes time. It's called the journey of faith, walking with the Lord, following him. I'm not saying you and I have to get saved and be perfect, but what I'm saying is discipline, learning discipline, finding how to appreciate discipline, welcoming me even when we don't like it. I told you last week you would hear me screaming about this fast. I told you that I wasn't going to like it. I told you I was going to struggle with it, but I know I need it. I know that. There's a part of me that knows I need it. And that's the part I'm going to choose to follow. Number two, many prophets, many so-called prophets are slap happy. And and I use that term again to mean not just people who are used in the prophetic or who declare themselves to be prophets. I I mean every believer. And and that should not be. God hasn't called us to that. Amen? He's, He's called us away from that. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And number three, when the gifts are greasy, the results are runny. (laughs) How do you like that? I love that. When the gifts are greasy, the results are runny. Well, that's uh, uh, to play on words. At the end of the battle, well, really the only battle was one arrow. (laughs) That's that's a pretty pretty final battle, isn't it? (laughs) Doink, One, one arrow. And the battle's over. Now, they fought throughout the day. But at the end of it, when everybody began to say, well, okay, this was a mess, wasn't it? This was a big disaster. When everybody said, well, maybe the 400, where are those 400 prophets? Get them. Why aren't they out here fighting? Why aren't they? They're the ones that said, oh, this is going to be the way it is. This is what's going to happen. This is how the political, uh, God says this is going to happen. Where are they at? And this is what grieves me in the church. And I'm talking about America. They'll go right back, buy the books, go to the conferences, say all the say, oh, no, don't. I may not be able to convince you, but let me talk to you as a church. Don't. When the gifts are greasy, when the way they're presented, when the way they're experienced has absolutely no boundary, no, no, no containment, when, when everything can just fly and be credited or blamed on God. I'm going to tell you what the results are. They're going to make people run. People are going to run away. If the only folks you ever look at are the people sitting on the pew in front of you or behind you or next to you, you're going to be convinced that everything in your church is perfect. But you have to look beyond the other people that feel just the way you do. You have to look beyond the other people that say the same things you do. And you've got to say, God, what are you doing here? What's the big picture? Thank God for Jehoshaphat. He saved his life by saying, where is a prophet that will declare the word of the Lord? Saved his life. Might well have saved his kingdom. When the gifts are easy peasy, uh, when grace is greasy, oh, everything's fine. God loves us all. Oh, we're just going to do anything we want, and when we get there, he'll straighten it all out. When everything is greasy, the results become very runny. And the enemy will bear down. Let me tell you, when the enemy bears down, everybody will start running. Everybody. It's time for us to regroup. Amen. Here at Central in 2020, what year are we? 21. We are going to focus on evangelism. I'm excited about this coming Easter. We're going to, do, we're going to try and do a door-to-door outreach again. I'm hoping 50 or 100 of us will go out. I think much of the virus will be behind us for whatever reason. And we're going to go out door-to-door. We're going to get you prepared over the weeks. We're going to talk to you about going out and just knocking on a door, saying we have a gift for you. Is there anything you want us to pray about today? And we're going to go. We're going to be the evangelist of the Lord Jesus Christ. We may 
may not be able to save the world. We may not be able to save the nation. But God put us here in the tri-state area to bring hope to a hopeless world, to bring life to a dead world, to bring encouragement to those who are discouraged, and to bring the power of resurrection, to bring life, to say to the people, there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Get ready. He's coming soon. Get ready. He's coming back. And he's coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Hallelujah. He's coming for a bride that's prepared. He's coming for a bride that loves him and knows how to look for him. He's coming for one that's not in love with this world, but in love with his world. He's coming for one that's not in love with the power here, but the power he has. He's looking for a bride that says, come Lord Jesus, that the bride and the spirit know how to interact and how to call him back. You and I are the king's kids. We know who he is. We serve him. We live for him. We live with him. We don't have to worry about the enemy's arrows piercing our armor. The Lord Jesus Christ has caused us to put on the full armor of God, to put it on and to know how to live in it, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that it's a complete full armor. There are no inadequacies. There are no vulnerable joints because Jesus Christ loves us with an everlasting love. Amen. He loves us with an everlasting love. He died to protect us, preserve us, and present us faultless before the Heavenly Father. Yeah, I, I, if I had the freedom to talk about what the prophets of this nation just did to us, I was on the phone one night. I've told you the story before, but it bears repeating. The the, the work of the prophet is never to tell you what you want to hear. Whenever you're being told what you want to hear and there's a stamp of God's approval on it, you're in trouble. And one night, 2006, through a series of events, Brother David Wilkerson was on the phone with me, called, and he's talking to me about evangelism and the ministry of the evangelist talk for a half an hour is fantastic this is just you know for me as a kind of uh, young middle-aged guy I think I was in my uh, 40s at that early 40s at that time and he's just encouraging me and, and I know what he's done in evangelism and I'm so excited and he says I'm gonna pray for you it's okay great and I'm ready we're praying and this is what he says there's two things he prays about and the first one he says Lord send him to those who cannot afford to have him come and preach I'm like, whoa, time out here. No, wait, wait. So inside, I'm having a discussion with myself. The second thing he says is, Lord, send him to the nations. Send him overseas where the need is so great. Now, I'm not talking to me. I'm talking directly to God. And I'm saying, God, don't listen to him. This is not what I want. This is terrible. How can this happen? God, no way. I'm on the phone with a prophet. I know he's a living prophet. There is no way on your green earth that this is what, you can't do this. How? This is not possible, God, and yesterday. I wired the first payment to Pakistan, $10,000. March, I'll be in Pakistan Fourteen years, 15 years later, and I'm living exactly what that man prayed. But not in, almost not any of it was what I wanted. The general picture I did want, and that was that God was calling me into evangelism, and God was sending me out, but I didn't want to be sent his way. I want to be sent my way. I'm not telling you that nothing about the prophetic will line up with your heart. It will. There's part of God's heart that's automatically in line with every kid's heart, every believer, every son, every daughter, but the details are his. And when you and I get our will in the way, when we say, God, you can't do it that way. Oh, gang, we're not where we need to be. And if all the prophets tell you everything you want to hear, They may be the Lord's prophets, but they're not speaking for him. Bow your heads with me this morning. Let's pray. We're running past our time. Father, thank you so much for the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you love us and you help us in every season. doesn't matter what we face. We're heartbroken here in our nation because we're fraying at the edges and splitting down the middle. We're coming apart as chaos moves into every camp. 
But oh God, the church still has the power. The church still has the answer. The church still has the Holy Spirit to bring healing to our wounds, to bring deliverance to our entanglements, to bring resurrection to our deadness. God, thank you that the church is still alive here in America, that the church still can call upon the Lord, that the church can still be salt and light. Glory to God. Your heads are bowed for just a moment all over this church this morning. I'm talking to you. Usually I talk to those joining us online, but today I'm talking to you. Do you understand the nature of the prophetic? I'm not talking about a prophet. I'm not talking about John the Baptist wearing crazy clothes and eating strange food. I'm not talking about Elijah creating fear everywhere he went. I'm talking about the New Testament opportunity, the invitation that the Holy Spirit gives us to live in the prophetic, to love through the prophetic, and to look for God to work in the lives of lost people because of the prophetic. I want you to take just a moment this morning. I, I challenged you back a few months ago to begin to pray for evangelists, to begin to pray and beg and plead with God that he would release evangelists. And I realized that I kind of set you up because throughout this year, you're going to get invitations from me to join us as we go out into our city and do loving evangelism. But today I want to talk to you about the prophet, the trappings, the methods, the lifestyle of the prophet, discipline, self-surrender, loving Jesus and looking to him for everything. If you'd say, Pastor, today, I, I, I get it, I understand, and I, I want the world to see me as a child of the king. I want the world to identify me as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm calling you today to. That's what the Holy Spirit is inviting us to. And I think every child of God has to say, yes, yes, I will. Yes, that's, that's the Lord calling me. You may face things in your own life that you have no answers for. You may have situations where you beg God for a word. I know I have a million times and I most likely will a million more. And I've been grieved when I felt like God never spoke to me or through someone else. I've been grieved when it felt like I needed, desperately needed to hear from heaven and could not find a word. But I found the Lord was with me in the situation. I may have been too worried about details. I may have been looking at circumstances. But as I looked back, I realized the Lord, as he said, he was there. He went through it with me. He stayed beside me. He steadied me when I was shaking and nervous. He calmed me when anxiety was bubbling up within me. He encouraged me when I was discouraged and felt like I was all alone. And that's our Lord. That's Jesus Christ coming into our lives and staying with us, camping with us no matter what we face. That's the goodness of God. Would you stand with me this morning all over the house? Would you stand with me in the house of the Lord this morning? <clears throat> One of the things I want to start doing this year is easing us back into the altar. We, we just cannot sing, listen, and be transformed. There has to be a participation. And that participation comes when we step in to what God's saying by covenant and say, Lord, I may not be good at this, but help me. I, I may not do this right, but help me. And so this morning, right there where you are, but also at this altar, and I'm not fully comfortable yet in how I want to do this. So today it's just going to be me talking a little bit. But I want to get us to that point. If you want to step out and say, oh, I've, I've got to be serious about this walk, then I want you to do that. If you're going to make that commitment there where you are, I want you to do that. But I want you to bow your head for just a moment. 
And if you will, I've got my hand over my chest. You might do that or you might slip a hand up. But I just want to lead you in a moment of talking to the Lord. I don't want to get in your way. But I'll come alongside you. And let's say this, something like this to the Lord Jesus. Jesus, you love the church. That means you love me. And in your church, the nature of the prophet is alive. And let that nature, nature of discipline, a nature of surrender, a nature of liking other people and being gentle with them, let that be my nature. When I need to take a stand, help me to take a stand humbly and to walk in it. Now you talk to the Lord for just a, a minute or two more there. You who are watching us this morning, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not surrendered to him, you can criticize the church, you can complain about the church, you can try to eliminate the church, but I'm going to tell you something, the church is going to come at you. It may be one, it may be a thousand, but the church is never going to stop praying for you, never going to stop loving you, never going to stop telling you the truth that there is eternal life ahead and you need to choose Jesus to find it. The way is narrow and few there be that find it. Why don't you be one of the few? Call out to him, surrender, cry to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, save me. Save me from sin. Save me from this world. Save me from myself that I can live for you. Lord Jesus, touch those right now who are watching, who are ready to make a kingdom commitment. Touch them. Deliver them. Deliver them from the devil and from oppression. Deliver them from anxiety and deliver them from evil. Deliver them from addictions and entanglements and deliver them into the presence of the living God, that they might be filled up to overflowing with the joy and power of the King of glory. And we thank you for it today. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. In just a moment, Brother Ricky's going to lead us in some worship before we get out of here. Next week, I'm going to start, I, I've prayed about this all week and I just don't feel it yet, but next week, I believe, I'm going to start working the altar to where I'm bringing you. Okay, we'll have Dr. Paul here. I'm going to talk to him about it. He texted me just two seconds before I stepped up here and uh, said, I'm ready. I'm ready. So we're going to try and get to where we're comfortable. If those of you who are getting the vaccine, if you can get it, get it. Those of you who don't feel comfortable with it, still stay safe and distanced or whatever. But let's believe God that we can come back in to the power of God. Amen. Church, I love you. Thank you for allowing me to do what I do. Thank you for understanding the kingdom and proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ wherever you go.